Hilton, and I've been a member of this congregation for five years. I've taught religious education for four of those years. I was raised in Montclair, but spent my adult life in Brooklyn up until nine years ago. I married a Brooklyn man who sometimes plays trumpet with these fine musicians. We have three children, two who have already gone through the powerful coming of age rites of passage ceremony that this community offers. So yes, I am one of you. I'm so glad to finally, formally meet you all. For those of you who already know me a little or a lot, I'm beyond grateful that you are here. Today is Social Justice Sunday, and as much as I love social justice, that's not what I'm going to talk to you about today. But we're going to start there, if that's all right with you. Is that all right with you? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Raise your hands if you know who Claudette Colvin is. It's okay if you don't, no worries, but raise your hand. Okay, a couple people. Claudette Colvin was a 15-year-old teenager in Montgomery, Alabama. She was a member of the NAACP Youth Council, and the civil rights movement was definitely the hot topic of her day. In fact, Claudette had just written a paper in school about the racist practices of retailers in her town, and how if you had to buy shoes, you had to draw an outline of your foot on a piece of paper and give it to the salesperson. Claudette had to ride the public school bus every day because her parents didn't own a car. The buses were segregated, with black people only allowed to sit in the back. If the bus filled up and no more seats were available, black people were made to get up and give their seat to any white customer upon demand. I think it's important to note that black people were 78% of the public bus customers. One day, Claudette and another black passenger were told by the bus driver to get up. Claudette shouted that her constitutional rights were being violated. She was handcuffed, arrested, and forcibly removed from the bus. Claudette was charged and found guilty of disturbing the peace, violating the segregation laws, and a trumped-up charge of assault. Luckily, she was bailed out by her minister, who told her, you have brought the revolution to Montgomery. That is Claudette Colvin. Now, who is the black history icon famous for getting arrested because they refused to give up their seat to a white person? Anybody? Who was that? Say it loud. Okay, it's a smart crowd. I like this. Claudette's incident happened in March 2nd of 1955, nine months before Rosa Parks' famous arrest for the exact same offense. Claudette said, my mother told me to be quiet about what I did. She told me to let Rosa be the one. White people aren't going to bother Rosa. They like her. It's been said black organizations felt Rosa Parks would be a better test case for integration because she was an adult, not a rebellious teenager like Claudette, and had the kind of hair and appearance needed to make her look middle class. How bad does it suck that Claudette had to let go of such a groundbreaking moment in history? How must she have felt watching Rosa Parks be the one, and through the decades remain the one who was honored and exalted as the mother of the civil rights movement because Rosa was more marketable? I would have been so pissed off. Are you kidding me? I got arrested, but I'm not good enough to represent the movement? You should know Claudette has publicly stated how proud she was of Rosa's accomplishments but also deeply hurt by her own erasure from this history. In 2016, the National Museum of African American History opened with a full room dedicated to Rosa Parks. Claudette Coleman did not even get an invitation to the opening day ceremonies. The Islamic theologian and poet Rumi famously stated, life is a balance between holding on and letting go. I'll add, life is also full of challenges and choices, some more difficult than others. There are beautiful and awful things that will happen to you, just like they happened to Claudette. In your family life, love life, with your friendships, with your career, things that happen to you publicly or privately that will shake you to your core. It could be the loss of a parent or the loss of a job, your health or your loved life being compromised. 
It could be something you put time and love and energy into and suddenly it backfires on you. You're confused, sad, angry. You can't let go of that hurt or betrayal or like Claudette, being forgotten and pushed aside. It's easy to get suffocated by that moment. Has anyone ever felt that way, even a little bit? Yeah. Most of us gather ourselves up and move on, but some of us are still living in that moment of brokenness. Listen, you cannot let traumatic moments stop you from finding joy in your life. You cannot let hard times keep you from becoming the incredible person you're supposed to be, doing the important work that you should be doing in your home or in your community. Many of us have that friend we love dearly who still carries with them the wounds of a difficult breakup, even though years have passed. You stop asking them to go anywhere with you because they insist on dragging that huge sack of sadness everywhere they go. They just can't seem to let go of a relationship that has already let go of them. Then there's that co-worker who's so miserable. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You just want to scream, you are that unhappy here. Please, get another job. <laughs> Nobody wants to be that person. Sometimes it's trauma that happens to us as a child. Abuse, neglect, feeling terminally ignored or misunderstood. It has a way of lingering. I'm not minimizing that experience at all by saying, oh, you just need to get over it. That's not what this is about. What I'm asking you is, are you holding on to disappointments so tightly because that's all you're used to and that's all you think you deserve? You don't even have room in your hands or your heart to pick up a little peace of mind because you keep hoarding the misery. Let go of it. Let go of all of it. You know why I'm speaking to you about healing yourself on Social Justice Sunday? Revolutions aren't sustainable without self-care. I see caregivers and justice workers all the time who are on their way to being burnt out. We are inundated with images and incidents in the news, in our own communities, in our government, we hear women speak of their own sexual assaults and our own Me Too moments resurface. We see immigrant children in cages and we start to think of our own ancestors and what they must have gone through. We live in triggering times. The goal is not to eliminate the emotions that surface, but we can at least work on dealing with our own idiosyncrasies before we go into the world and try to help someone else. Writer James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Face it. Whatever has you uncomfortable, you need to face it. We want to be great friends, neighbors, allies, but if you can't acknowledge your own privilege, faults, or biases, then what kind of ally are you really going to be? You want to be a good parent, a good citizen, professor, judge, church leader, yet you're struggling with personal issues that are keeping you from getting there. No one can jumpstart the letting go process but you. But we can let you know we're here for you. Please don't let whatever happened to you in the past keep you from being present to the possibilities of right now. American psychologist Peter Levine said, the paradox of trauma is that it has both the power to destroy and the power to transform and resurrect. Hold on to who and what is transformative. Let go of who and what is destructive. You can't hold on to all of your issues and still have room for love, acceptance, laughter and abundance, and healthy reciprocal relationships. It just won't all fit. We're not built that way. So what do we do? Well, here, here are five quick things we can do. First, acknowledge that you need and deserve growth. You know what's got a hold on you. You feel sadness in a crowded room or anger at family gatherings, and you waste too much time trying to eat that feeling and pretend like it's not there. 
Denial will not serve you. You've got to acknowledge it if it's ever had a chance to dissipate it. The second thing is you should take your healing seriously. Injured soldiers don't win wars. If you have a broken leg, you let someone take you to the hospital, get a cast, use the crutches until you were able to walk on your own, you wouldn't even think twice about that. Whatever you're dealing with now needs the same treatment. Emotional healing is just as critical as physical, even more so. Third, you need to come up with a plan. As triggering as this world can sometimes be, it's also chock full of resources and safe places to help you work on yourself. There's meditation, counseling, self-help programs, books, therapy, retreats. There's physical things like hiking, yoga, exercise, treating yourself to a day off. There's also creative aids like journaling and vision boarding. Start somewhere. If you don't know where to start, consult with a life coach who can get, help you to map it out. Not your friends. Your friends are there to listen, not solve not prescribe. Number four is a big one. It takes time. Stop thinking the damage from years in an abusive relationship is magically erased because you're single now. Stop thinking the effects of 400 years of slavery is undone with one black president. Racism is much more deep-seated than that. Don't assume one session in a therapist with a therapist cures you. Your mind needs time to adjust. It took a while for things to get so tangled up. It may take twice as long to smooth things out. But the investment you make in yourself is the most valuable time and money you will ever spend. Lastly, don't ever believe that you're the only one. We are all going through something at some point. Most of us, unless our last name is Kardashian, don't want to air out our dirty laundry. <laughs> we don't want to be judged, I get it. Well, let me tell you a little secret. People are judging you anyway. To hell with what people think. You've got to live in your own truth. And if that means therapy or yoga retreats or cutting certain friends and family members out of your life, whatever self-care means for you, do it. Maybe someone will see you taking good care of yourself, and they'll be inspired to do the same. You'd be surprised at how much the people around you are going through. Sometimes, even some of the same stuff. Let's revisit Claudette Colvin for a moment. She was branded a troublemaker after that bus incident. Soon after being arrested, she was 16, unmarried, and pregnant, which further alienated her from her community. She moved to New York because no one would give her a job where she lived. And Rosa Parks, the mother of the civil rights movement, she was also branded a troublemaker and had no one finding jobs locally either. She ended up moving to Detroit, Michigan. Both ladies caught quite a bit of grief for their part in the Montgomery bus boycott. But you should know it was Claudette Colvin, not Rosa Parks, who was one of the five plaintiffs named in the case that went all the way to the Supreme Court and defeated bus segregation in the state of Alabama. A flawed teen, unwed mother, pushed aside for not being acceptable enough, and still Claudette left her mark at the Supreme Court level. These are the things we need to hold on to. Our victories, our triumphs, the success stories that prove our efforts count. We don't need to be perfect people to raise amazing children or advocate against archaic voting laws. But if we don't take care of our own selves seriously, some of us won't make it long enough to truly enjoy the fruits of our labor. In the pews, you'll find index cards. I want you to pick up an index card, please. And think for a moment about the thing that keeps you from becoming the person you really want to be. Take a pencil and write it down. No names are needed, just the issue that is clogging you. Now, if you've never faced challenges 
or trauma in your life, you have a blessed existence. <laughs> you can write down the issue that you'd most like to see banished in our world, be it blocked voting rights, homophobia, patriarchy, misogyny, I mean, there's a million things. And whatever you choose, when you step forward, let that solidify your commitment to eradicating that issue. I'm going to give you a moment to write that thing down, and then I'm going to invite you to come to the front. Marcus, where's my magic box? I see it. Okay. We're going to let go of whatever it is that is blocking you. You're going to come down this way, and then when you finish dropping it, you'll just walk down the middle aisle back to your seats. Thank you. 